Welcome to the Strangeology Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Foran, and this is your place to explore the weird, the strange, the unexplained, from cryptids and creatures, the paranormal, aliens and UFOs, forbidden knowledge, ancient mysteries, to conspiracy theories, and more. So, hey everyone, it's been a minute. Thank you for waiting, for sticking around, and bearing with me the past couple of months. I guess it's been like four months or so. If you follow me over on Instagram, you know that my partner and I welcomed our second child into the world just after Christmas. And it's been a total whirlwind adjusting to being parents to two kids that coupled also with getting periodically sick because our older kid is in school. So it's like every couple weeks cycling through the different viral loads that are out there. We barely just got over this totally awful stomach bug that put me out of commission for the better part of 10 days. Doing a lot better now though. But anyway, of course, you know, that all takes priority. But now I am back with my third season premiere. Stoked to be here. And it's this episode, I'm just going to cut right to the chase. It's going to be about my favorite cryptid, the Jersey Devil, which I can't believe it's taken me over two years of doing this podcast to get around to, but there's so much to talk about. And I'm also a pretty busy dude. So, but hey, Strangeology Podcast also celebrated its two year anniversary at the end of December. So it's, it's hard to believe, man, time just flies doing doing fun stuff, I guess. So thank you for listening as always, sharing the show, and again, being patient while the show is on break. But it feels good to be back. And before we get into the episode today, I want to welcome any new listeners out there to the show. If you haven't given me a follow over on social media yet, things get pretty wild over there from time to time on Instagram and TikTok particularly, especially if you're looking for extra short form content from me. I like to try to put out a couple short form videos each week as I have time. I was doing like every day for a while, but then that just got too much once the new kiddo came along. But coming up this year, I'm going to attempt to add a bunch more long form video content over on my YouTube channel as well. And I got a lot of interesting topics that I'm going to be covering for the show this season and some interviews with some people that I'm pretty stoked about lining up. 2022 was an awesome year of growth for the show. We passed 100,000 downloads back in November, just around the time of like Cryptid Con. <laughs> I had a huge a huge boost in in listenership and people checking out the show after I I hung out with Tony over on the confessionals so if you're new here after listening to that thanks for stopping by and people are still listening and downloading and checking out the show so thanks for sticking around also I wanted to welcome several new members to the Strangeology Patreon since the last time I did an episode there's a bunch of new folks around So welcome to Miguel, Gabriel, Albert, Nicole, Shane, Britt, Lene, Jeff, and Carlos. There's a lot of awesome benefits over on the Patreon, like merch discounts, exclusive merch, shout outs, early access to episodes, bonus episode extensions. And if you didn't notice, there are ads running on the show now. So if you are a member, you get ad free shows, which is pretty exciting. (laughs) All right. Well, just going to keep this intro short and sweet. Why don't we get into the story of my favorite cryptid, the Jersey Devil? Let's go. (laughs) 
So the Jersey Devil is probably my favorite cryptid. I'm not entirely sure why, but there's, you know, more cryptids that I've researched over the past couple of years. So sometimes that first place position has been getting a little shaky because there's a lot of cool, cool stories. But I just I love the story of the Jersey Devil. There's a lot of really cool history and folklore around it. So what is this terrifying creature? And what is its origin? So this is a story based in southern New Jersey, which dates back centuries. And the people who live there know it quite well. The Jersey Devil is also known as the Leeds Devil, but to a lesser extent. And these are kind of new to me after doing a deep dive researching this and and buying several books. There's other names for it. There's the Jabberwock the kangaroo horse, flying death, the king of wing, cowbird, the hoodle doodle, <laughs> and the air hoss. I would say that the last two are probably my top picks for alternate Jersey devil names. <laughs> so what is this thing? Well, there are a few variations of the story, but aside from some minor details, there is a pretty common theme among them all. The story begins in the Jersey Pine Barrens in 1735. The exact location isn't known for sure, but the town of Leeds Point, Burlington, and Estelleville are commonly cited as where this all began. The legend goes that a woman, who in some virgins is a witch named Mother Leeds, had become pregnant with her 13th child. And where was the husband in all of this? Well, that part isn't 100% clear, though some think the father was this useless deadbeat. Others think that the father was Satan himself. And I know you're thinking 12 kids already. Why? Why not one more? The thing is, having lots of children was a relatively common thing a few hundred years ago. If you look in any genealogical record, for example, my own family tree of records, and I've got distant relatives from generations back that had 9, 10, 11, even 12 children at times. And you have to remember, this is before the age of modern medicine, infant mortality rate was a lot higher, so not every kid would make it through infancy or childhood. There was a lot of disease that children could succumb to because of lack of medication and proper knowledge or care on how to treat things. So one thing that's never been clear in the story is whether or not Mother Leeds, cheaper by the dozen lifestyle, <laughs> means that all of her kids were alive or not. Maybe they were, but chances are in the, in the early 1700s, probably not. But I digress. <laughs> the important part here is that when she realized that she was with child, she anguished at the reality of bearing one more kid, and she wound up cursing her unborn child. And the quote, the famous quote is that she said, let this one be the devil. And this curse would apparently be realized upon the birth of the child. When Mother Leeds went into labor to give birth, the story is that it was a dark and stormy night. It's, you know, the uh, standard setting for uh, some stuff about to go down. The wind and rain was heavy and were, it was pummeling their small home in the Pine Barrens. And the most common version this story seems to be is that Mother Leeds' midwives aided in the successful delivery of a normal baby boy. And within moments, it became this horrific sight as the baby began to transform into this hideous, demonic-looking creature. Father Leeds and the children apparently heard the commotion, I assume, as Mother Leeds and the midwives were probably screaming in terror. The baby's legs were said to turn into the legs of a goat with cloven hoofs, and it sprouted a forked tail and wings from its back. As the transformation continued, its head contorted and stretched out into something that resembled the face of a goat or a horse. Now, in some stories, they say that once this creature got its hellish makeover, it swatted everyone in the room with its tail. In other versions, 
one of the midwives tried to step in and take charge, but the creature straight up killed her and then proceeded to take out other family members as well. And after the carnage was complete, it looked for an exit and found the fireplace in the room and wound up flying up through the chimney and out into the Pine Barrens, and the rest is history. In other versions, it says that the child was born as a devil already, or had some kind of birth deformity and actually lived at home until he was four years old and was kept away from the public in fear of scrutiny. That's a lesser known part of the story. But in the more popular version, the creature flies out of the chimney. And let's be honest, that's kind of a more badass story, right? And afterwards, the Jersey Devil's reign of terror didn't just stop. It proceeded to attack residents of the area over the course of the next five years, where it would fly around killing livestock, pets, fish in local streams. It was also said to have maimed and taken out children. And yeah, it was just a, a, a general menace to society. In the book Phantom of the Pines by James McElroy and Ray Miller Jr., we have this excerpt from one of the earliest written accounts about the Jersey Devil that was published in Atlantic Monthly, written by a W.F. Mayer. Now, Mayer had visited Burlington County, New Jersey in May of 1858, and he had heard stories of this ghastly beast that lurked in the Pine Barrens. So he asked his buddy named Mr. B, who was from there, and what the details were, and it was essentially the same as what I had mentioned a few minutes ago. The baby turns into this flying demonic fiend with bat wings and a horse face. <laughs> it kills, eats, or mauls most of the family members, and then escapes. In this version, though, it's mentioned that after the creature reigned terror on the area for five years, this holy man a priest managed to exorcise it by candle, book, and bell and sealed it away for 100 years. And so the story of the Leeds Devil, as it was known then, was passed down through the generations that followed. And interestingly, during the Revolutionary War, tales of the Jersey Devil led to the British Army avoiding areas like the Pine Barrens, which gave the colonials an advantage in the war. Now, after the 100 years was up, the residents of Burlington County were apparently on high alert, those who remembered the story. And according to Mr. B, ever since 1840, strange howling and screaming could be heard emanating from the Pine Barrens. Now, let's talk about the history of pre-colonial New Jersey and the Pine Barrens themselves. The Lenny Lenape tribe, also referred to as the Delaware tribe, inhabited this area, and specifically the Delaware and Hudson River valleys, for thousands of years before Europeans arrived in North America. At least up until the end of the last ice age, some 12 to 13,000 years ago. The area we call the state of New Jersey today was colonized by the Swedish and Dutch in 1609 and was subsequently taken over by the English in 1664. Interestingly, the colony's first name was actually Nova Caesarea, which was the Latinized version of New Jersey, named, of course, after the British Isle of Jersey. So back to the Lenape. The connection here, and why some researchers think the origins of the Jersey Devil date back much farther than 1735, is the fact that the Lenape name for the Delaware River was, and I'm probably going to butcher this, but Papwessing, which means place of the dragon. And early European explorers like the Swedes came to call the river Drake Kill, which translates to Dragon River. The Lenape also had a deity that they worshipped called Mising, who was a sky god who ensured that crops would grow and it would heal the sick and prevent natural disasters. Descriptions of what this being looked like could be found in the dress a Lenape tribe member would wear during one of their ceremonial dances. The wearer of the garb would have a bearskin on, along with red and black paint to hide any human features. Early European colonists would surely have believed this was a devil, you know, coming from uh, Christianity and religious background. 
Now, this could just be a coincidence, but it's definitely caused some researchers to wonder about a potential connection. Now, I would say a dragon is not the first thing that comes to mind when I think of the Jersey Devil, but later stories of people running into this thing do describe it having some very dragon-like characteristics, which I'll, I'll get into later. Now, if you're unfamiliar with New Jersey and the Pine Barrens, you're probably wondering what it is. The Pine Barrens, or Pinelands, is a 1.2 million acre area covering 1,700 square miles in the southeastern portion of New Jersey that contains the Wharton, Brendan T. Byrne, Penn, and Bass State Forests. It's basically this heavily forested, sparsely populated coastal plain that covers roughly a quarter of the whole state, but it wasn't always like that after Europeans arrived. Early settlers tried to farm the land, but due to the acidity of the soil and being nutrient poor, they found that the best crops to grow there were cranberries and blueberries, and because of the high sand content of the land, people were able to begin to do pottery, glassmaking, logging and iron industries also began to pop up and for centuries this area was just stripped of its natural resources and it wasn't until the late 1970s actually that legislation was passed to even protect things there like the aquifer that supplied water to the people and it's now designated as a biosphere reserve which is pretty cool if you do find yourself in the pine barrens you can still find old iron furnace structures that dot the landscape. I've never actually been in the Pine Barrens, like walking on foot, but I've driven kind of through and near the area on the white and black horse pikes that kind of, they kind of go around like the southern edge of it, I believe. Then this was sidebar years ago during, during a little road trip excursion with one of my buddies who's originally from New Jersey. And his dad had this story when he was younger, like late teens, early 20s, driving around the Pine Barrens late at night and seeing this figure on the side of the road that looked like a hitchhiker or something. And he couldn't really make out what the figure looked like, but it held up its hand and pointed a thumb out, you know, the universal hitchhiker sign, I need a, I need a, a ride. And he, he could make out that the, this person or thing, whatever it was, the thumb was inhumanly long. And it freaked him out, so he hit the gas and sped off. Now, this was like late 60s, early 70s. Maybe he was seeing things. Maybe he, he, had, he had had a couple cold ones. I don't know. But it was an interesting and entertaining story. When my friend and I were driving through that area back around 2005 or so, didn't see anything weird. But <laughs> yeah, there, there's a lot of, a lot of stories in, in that area for sure. So Back to the Jersey Devil. Despite the alleged sealing away of the creature for a hundred years, between 1740 and 1840, one of the earliest written accounts of someone sighting this thing comes from a guy named Vance Larner, who claimed to have witnessed old JD near a pond in 1790 and sketched out what he saw. He described it as being Neither beast nor man nor spirit, but some hellish combination of all three. He described it as being the size of a moose with horns, a long tail that was whipping back and forth in the pond, bat wings, and cloven hooves. Apparently, it was rubbing its horns on a nearby tree, and when it finished, it let out some horrendous pained screech and flew off. Now, either this Vance Larner guy was an aspiring writer looking to get out of being a woodsman in the Pine Barrens, or he saw something very unusual that day. Another early witness account, which I love, is the tale of Stephen Decatur, who was a well-known Commodore in the Navy at the time. In 1819, he was sent out to New Jersey by then-President James Monroe to test out cannonballs at the Hanover Iron Works and to evaluate the furnaces there. According to the story one day during a test of cannonballs, the Jersey Devil was spotted flying right in the line of the cannon fire, and Decatur lined up the shot and fired. And apparently, 
he made a direct hit to the Jersey Devil. But to his surprise, the Jersey Devil was unfazed and kept flying until it was out of sight. Now, some have theorized that James Monroe may have had an ulterior motive for sending Decatur down there after hearing rumors of some strange, scary monster that lurked in the Pine Barrens. It's kind of like some presidents who came later, like Teddy Roosevelt, who supposedly wanted to hunt the Snallygaster and may have been connected with the Ozark Howler in a way. Now, as far as I can tell, there's no solid evidence other than hearsay, but in the book Jersey Devil by George Dudding, He mentions this side of the Decatur story, which involved him sailing to Burlington County, New Jersey, after receiving orders from the president. And he brought a doctor along with him named James Killian, who, for all intents and purposes, was someone who had a passion for studying cryptids, the weird, strange, that kind of stuff, kind of like a predecessor to Charles Fort. So Decatur and Dr. Killian arrive with a small group of men and begin their cannonball testing. Meanwhile, they begin speaking with locals of the area who started to tell them all about this hideous creature that lived in the forest, matching all the descriptions of the Jersey Devil that we know today. After they gathered this information, it seemed like this creature knew they were looking for it. And one night while Decatur and Dr. Killian and some of their crew were retired for the night in their temporary lodging, the Jersey Devil decided to come by and pay them a visit. The story goes that it crashed through one of the windows and began to attack them in their lodge. During the chaos, Dr. Killian pulled out his flintlock pistol and fired at the creature, while Decatur grabbed a sword and finished it off. After everything was settled, they found that one of their crew had been killed by the Jersey Devil. Afterwards, Dr. Killian performed an autopsy on the creature and discovered that it was a pregnant female. This led them to believe that somehow it either propagated itself or maybe there were more than one of these creatures out there. And there's no way that it could be the original since Mother Leeds gave birth to a boy, so it would seem. Anyway, I thought that was a pretty interesting twist on the Decatur story that I had not heard before. The other early account worth mentioning, it belongs to Joseph Bonaparte, also (laughs) Napoleon Bonaparte's brother. Joseph was the king of Spain from 1808 to 1813, and he wound up abdicating the throne after being unsuccessful at protecting Spain from England. Joseph then emigrated to America in 1815 and wound up settling in New Jersey. And according to this part of the legend, he was out hunting alone one winter day in the forest behind his home. He came upon a set of tracks that looked like they would belong to a two-footed donkey. One hoof print was larger than the other, which is how he kind of came to that conclusion. He followed them for a while, but then they stopped abruptly in the snow as if whatever these belonged to flew off. And as he puzzled over the scene, he heard this hissing noise coming from behind him. He turned around slowly, and then he found himself face to face with this abominable winged creature with a horse-like head and bird-like wings. Definitely sounds a lot like the Jersey Devil, although most descriptions describe it with bat wings, of course. (laughs) And after a tense stare down, the Jersey Devil beat its wings, hissed at him, and then flew off. Now, sporadic sightings took place throughout the rest of the 1800s, mostly concentrated around the Jersey Shore near Atlantic City. And if there were cases of missing or killed livestock from local landowners, the Jersey Devil was often blamed. He was also blamed for property damage during heavy storms in 1884, as the legend was pretty prominent in the minds of residents in this part of the state. And while most of the sightings were confined there, the last known sighting in the 19th century actually happened in Spring Valley, New York, about 150 miles north of Atlantic City and just over the state border, where a man named George Sorosi crossed paths with the beast and described it as a flying serpent. Now, perhaps the most well-known flap of sightings of the Jersey Devil case 
occurred long after the birth of this legend. Between January 16th and January 23rd, 1909, people from New Jersey, Delaware, Pennsylvania, just this whole area began reporting on mass of witnessing a flying devilish fiend who would appear in their towns and leave strange tracks and hoof prints around people's homes. And it would just be scaring people and, and causing a big ruckus. Missing pets and livestock were quickly blamed on the Jersey Devil, and it became like this mass hysteria event over the course of this week in the dead of winter. People began locking themselves in their homes at night, and even during the day, schools were closed. The police who encountered it took shots at it. And posses were formed to hunt down this strange and unknown beast. The first known encounter during this infamous week was by a Thack Cousins. Now, it was, it was the evening of January 16th in Woodbury, New Jersey. It's cold. It's snowy. Who wants to be out in weather like that? Cousins was on the street and saw this demonic thing fly over overhead and it looked like it was emitting steam before it disappeared from view it looked back at cousins and it had these glowing phosphorescent eyes which in cousins words he described as the eyes of the beast later that same night a number of people claimed to witness the creature in bristol new jersey some 30 miles south and i would think 30 miles is a long way to fly in just a couple hours, but maybe the Jersey Devil is really fast, or maybe there are more than one of these creatures, which is an interesting thought. And there are a ton more witnesses from this week. Watson Buck, who lived in Masonville, was asleep one night during this week and heard a noise, like something had thumped or, or landed just outside of his window in his bedroom. And the sound woke him up, but not enough to check to see what it was. However, the following morning, he, when he woke up, he found the tracks of a four-legged animal that were all around the outside perimeter of his house, and he swears until the day that he died that it must have been the Jersey Devil. Another notable encounter happened to Nelson Evans and his wife, who lived in Gloucester City. They watched as the Jersey Devil had landed on the roof of their nearby shed outside, and it walked around on it for a good 10 minutes. They described it as having all the classical characteristics of this thing. It was around three and a half feet tall with a horse's face, a collie dog-like head in general, bat-like wings that had a four-foot wingspan. Its back legs were like that of a crane's, but with horse hooves. It walked around on its hinds, and its front limbs had paws. A real ugly kind of chimera. Near the end of the ordeal, Nelson managed to shoo away the beast, but before it flew away into the night, it turned back and barked at him. Afterwards, hundreds of people would come to their home to hear about this, this encounter, and one of the most used images depicting the Jersey Devil, and I'll link it in the show notes, but you've probably seen it before, was sketched out based on the description given by the Evans. One of the stranger documented encounters in this period happened on January 21st at the Black Hawk Social Club on Ferry Ave in Camden around 1 o'clock in the morning. The bar owner, Frank Rowe, became distracted by a, quote, uncanny sound coming from outside the back window of the place. He decided to check it out, and to his horror, he saw staring into the bar through the window some horrifying creature. Frank recoiled and grabbed something that could be used as a weapon. And in that moment, all the bar patrons saw what was staring inside from out there. And naturally, everyone was scared out of their wits, and the whole place just emptied out. The creature then took off, it flew away, and it made this horrifying, blood-curdling sound, according to Frank. 
There were also several trolley drivers around New Jersey who reported run-ins with this thing. And some, t- some seem to think that the Jersey Devil had an affinity for these trolley cars. And the descriptions that come from the trolley drivers are that the Jersey Devil resembled a kangaroo with wings and a long neck. And it was overall downright hideous. There was even an account of a physical attack when some locals were walking down the street in West Collingswood, and they saw something on the roof of the local fire chief's house that looked kind of like an ostrich, but they knew that it had to be the Jersey Devil, up to no good, I'm sure. They alerted the fire department, and when a fire engine arrived at this point in history, I think it was probably one of the steam-powered ones versus horse-drawn, but... When it arrived, the firemen blasted water at the Jersey Devil, and they knocked it 50 yards down the street. And this was a bad idea because old JD didn't like getting blasted with the fire hose. (laughs) And the creature then wound up charging the firemen. And as a way to ward it off, they literally threw sticks and stones at it. I'm not sure why they didn't just blast more water at it. Maybe they ran out. But in any case, the melee lasted for a few minutes until the Jersey Devil got fed up and then just took to the sky and flew over the firemen, screamed at them, and it just went out of sight. (laughs) Policemen even encountered this thing, supposedly. One of the more well-known cases happened to Bristol, New Jersey officer James Sackville. He was a beat cop and patrolled sidewalks on foot. And As the story goes, he heard dogs barking at something, and he went to go investigate. And when he got near to where the dogs were barking, he could see this bizarre winged creature standing at a nearby canal. And with all the hysteria surrounding the Jersey Devil and not being sure what this thing was, he drew his weapon. The creature then hopped further down into the canal, and Sackville decided to run after it. And then whatever this thing was flew up into the sky. Sackville decided to take a few shots at it, and it either had no effect or more likely he, he missed it. He described it as emitting a terrible scream as it flew away. And one of the most unusual accounts, and probably a big ri- reason why some people classify the Jersey Devil as dragon-like, comes from a Mr. and Mrs. J.H. White, who lived in Philadelphia. So around four o'clock in the afternoon, Mrs. White goes outside of her home, and she sees this weird animal crouching down in her backyard. She has no idea what this thing is, and the sight of it startled her which caused it to turn and face her direction. And apparently, in that moment, it stood up and started to breathe fire at her. And naturally, she screamed in terror and fainted. All all of this noise alerted her husband, Mr. White, who was still inside their home. He rushed outside and also saw this bizarre beast shooting flames out of its face. And he noted that this thing was around six feet tall, but in an attempt to defend his wife in his home, he charged at this thing and managed to chase it over his fence and out of the area. Pretty brave dude, right? I don't know (laughs) if if there was a fire-breathing creature in my backyard. I don't know if I'd uh, go out, go chasing it. Maybe, who knows? If if I had like a, a baseball bat or something, I don't know. At one point, there were rumors that the Philadelphia Zoo was offering a $10,000 reward to anyone who could bring in a sample of this creature's poop, which resulted in tons of hoaxers to make the claim that they had evidence or even caught the Jersey Devil himself. There was even an instance where a man and his friend, who was an animal trader, bought a kangaroo from a circus and dressed it up with bat wings and fake claws. I'm not sure if people bought it, but they didn't actually admit that they faked the whole thing until 1929. So after the 1909 panic, sightings would periodically continue throughout the 20th century, and even up to today, where people throughout New Jersey and surrounding states, but especially the Pine Barrens still, report running into a large and menacing bat-winged creature. 
In some modern sightings, the Jersey Devil is reported to be frequently seen around a pond in the Pine Barrens called the Blue Hole. Some think this pond is bottomless, or it might be a remnant from an old mine in the 1700s. So if you do find yourself hiking out in that area, definitely be careful and and watch out for the Jersey Devil. I could keep going with sightings from 1909 and beyond, but there's just so many that it would probably take a couple more episodes to talk about them. So we're going to switch gears now. I wanted to dive into Mother Leeds a bit, as well as the family, and where this legend and cryptid supposedly originated from. So who was Mother Leeds? Well, her identity has been debated over the years. According to the historical record, there was a woman by the name of Jane Leeds Johnson, the wife of a Jake Johnson, who were residents of Leeds Point around this time in the early 1700s. She did have 12 children, but the story kind of varies after that. In her story, she had made a deal with the devil to take her 13th child, and that was only if the devil could get rid of her worthless husband. (laughs) Some also think that the identity of Mother Leeds was a woman named Mary Leeds. And then there's a theory that her identity is that of a Deborah Smith Leeds, who was the wife of Jaffet Leeds, one of Daniel Leeds' sons, who also lived at Leeds Point. Now, Daniel Leeds is important, so (laughs) definitely listen to this. Now, they actually did have... 12 children as well between 1704 and 1726 because of this timeline being so close to the start of the legend in 1735 Deborah Leeds is probably the most recognized identity of Mother Leeds in this story however I want to note that Jaffet Leeds was born in 1683 so he would have been about 52 years old when the Jersey Devil was supposedly born and Deborah was two years younger, so she would have been about 50. It's not unheard of for women of this age to get pregnant and give birth today at that age, but it's rare, and there are a lot of risks involved. And I would think that without modern medicine, the likelihood of that being successful is something to consider, but perhaps this is the true identity of Mother Leeds. Now, the first Leeds family member to arrive in America was Thomas Leeds, who traveled from England in 1676. Interestingly, some of the Leeds family members could be traced back to King Cedric of Wessex all the way back to the 6th century, which I can't imagine being able to trace your ancestry back that far, but I guess some people do have records. Thomas settled in what would become the New Jersey colony in the town of Shrewsbury in Monmouth County. Two years later, his son Daniel followed and arrived in Burlington, and he wound up finding quick success getting involved with land surveying and politics. Daniel Leeds is from whom all the modern Leeds family descended from, and his family eventually settled in Leeds Point. After living in America for almost a decade, Daniel published the American Almanac in 1687, which was the first of its kind. Uh, This book contained astrological data along with other content. Sounds pretty cool, right? Well, this book landed him in really big trouble with the Quakers, of which Leeds was a member himself and a devout one at that. At the time, they were the dominant Christian denomination in the area. They basically accused Daniel of using inappropriate language and symbols in his book, which were unchristian and too pagan for their liking. Now, interestingly, this book would later inspire a young Benjamin Franklin to write his own book. So eventually, Daniel issued a public apology, not wanting to stir up the wrath of his church. And even with that, the Quakers demanded that all copies of his American Almanac books be collected and destroyed. This pissed off Daniel, to the point that he actually wound up renouncing his affiliation with the Quakers, and he said to hell with it and continued to publish his book. Good on you, bud. (laughs) Now, after that, he wrote and published another book 
called the Temple of Wisdom, which was basically about his theories on the origin of the universe, which were inspired by the 16th century German mystic Jakob Burma. And over the next 10 to 11 years or so, Daniel Leeds found himself at odds with the Quakers, who tried to suppress his writing. And he even published an anti-Quaker book in 1699 called The Trumpet Sounded Out of the Wilderness of America. And in 1700, the Quaker's founder, George Fox, countered with a pamphlet that was handed out to the public that basically accused Daniel of working with the devil. It was called Satan's Harbinger Encountered. And perhaps this is a potential connection to the Jersey Devil legend. In 1716, Daniel neared the end of his life, and he left the almanac to two of his sons, Titan and Felix. Daniel wound up dying in 1720 at the age of 68 or 69, and as it turns out, his son Felix, the youngest of the two, didn't have any interest in carrying on with the almanac for Daniel, but his other son, Titan, did and shared a lot of the same philosophical interests as his father. And also, he had this innate ability for mathematics, and he became the sole person in charge of it. And I want to note that Titan would go on to redesign the front page of the almanac to include the Leeds family crest, which had a wyvern on it, which is a mythical winged creature. They're kind of like dragons, but the distinction between the two is that wyverns only have two hind legs and their arms are their wings just like birds, whereas the traditional European style dragon is depicted as typically having four legs along with a set of wings coming out of its back. Sounds a little bit familiar, right? You see, wyverns are on a lot of heraldic crests dating back to the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, so it's it's all kind of a, a pretty interesting connection. So in 1732, a 26 year old Benjamin Franklin wanted to enter the almanac game and created the Poor Richards Almanac to compete with the Leeds Almanac. Poor Richard Saunders was the pseudonym that Ben Franklin created for his book to use for himself. And eventually, this competition led to an all out feud between Ben Franklin and Titan Leeds, where Ben Franklin would constantly troll Titan in writing using astrological techniques to predict when Titan's death would happen. The first time was supposed to be in October of 1733, or he would talk trash about his father Daniel Leeds. And uh, when Titan didn't die in 1733, Franklin wrote to his readers saying that Titan must have resurrected himself from the grave and that his ghost was still publishing the almanac. Titan would issue responses in these exchanges in a war of words that would go on for the next five years until the Leeds almanac finally faded away and Titan faced his own actual death in 1738. And even after all that, Franklin published a letter joking about how Titan's ghost was now haunting him. A brutal founding father indeed. <laughs> like... Ben Franklin was relentless, apparently. Yeah, so, and because of these exchanges, Franklin was kind of like slandering and defaming, albeit in a satirical way. People began to brand the Leeds family as the Leeds Devils. And around the same time, of course, we have the birth of the Jersey Devil legend in 1735. So perhaps the legend was just based on the exchanges between Franklin and Leeds. But what of all the sightings in the following almost 300 years since the Jersey Devil joined the party? Surely people were seeing something out there. I want to go over a couple of theories as to what people may have actually been seeing during different flaps where this thing appears. One of the theories that was suggested by a paleontologist from the Smithsonian after looking at plaster casts of tracks left by the devil, supposedly, that it could be a relic from the Jurassic period. So, a living dinosaur. Interestingly, there was a dinosaur called Ornithomimus coelosaurus antiquus 
also known as the bird mimic, that bears a striking resemblance to what some witnesses have described as the the Jersey Devil looking like. And this dinosaur actually has fossils that have been found in Burlington County. But how would it be possible for a dinosaur like that to survive the KT extinction event that happened 65 million years ago? I guess we'd have to look at animals like sharks, alligators, crocodiles, even the coelacanth, which was thought to be extinct, which have all been around for over 200 million years. Other people have suggested that it could be some kind of surviving species of pteranodon or pterodactyl as well, but I feel like those are too big and too reptilian to describe a good old JD. Maybe we're looking at something like interdimensional time slips. Maybe something comes through from the past into like the modern era. I don't know. Another theory out there that I like is that the Jersey Devil was actually a hammerhead bat. And if you look at pictures of one of these animals, the resemblance is absolutely uncanny compared to descriptions of the devil himself. And I'll throw a link in the, in the, the show notes with a picture of one of these things. It has this long face that could be just described as almost horse-like. It has a three and a half foot wingspan, which isn't too far off from some descriptions. The only problem is that the hammerhead bat is from Africa. So the only way one of these things was flying around back then is if someone had brought one over back in the 18th century or even early 20th century during the 1909 flap and it got loose. I can picture a circus doing something like that, but it's all kind of speculation. And then some people think that kind of like Mothman, the the Jersey Devil might be a kind of harbinger for war, as there have apparently been major sightings or flaps of sightings before all of these significant wars since the Revolutionary War. A civil war, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and beyond. And then there's the mass hysteria explanation, which some people think may be connected with exposure to some kind of chemical substance like ergot, which is a toxic fungus that can grow on edible grains like wheat and rye. LSD is actually derived from it. And there are two responses to ingesting it. One is ergot poisoning, which affects the nervous system, digestive system, and even the cardiovascular system, which leads to a lack of oxygen from constricting blood vessels. This can lead to developing gangrene, so you're going to have a bad time. The other response is actually hallucinogenic, which would make people probably act strange. This is called ergotism, and it's thought that the dancing plague that happened between the 13 and 1600s that you may have heard about, even the Salem witch trials, were likely caused by the consumption of grains that were contaminated with ergot. So some have suggested that the mass hysteria around the 1909 flap may have been caused by something like this. I don't think there's any substantiation or, or evidence to those claims that I could find at least. I could be wrong, but that is definitely a possibility. And finally, there is just simple misidentification, which is shared with the story of the Mothman, which is that the Jersey Devil is a sandhill crane. This bird has historically had habitat in New Jersey, so perhaps it's possible this one could be the culprit. Skeptics point to this as the likely candidate due to some people describing the Jersey Devil's hind legs as looking crane-like. The Sandhill Crane is supposedly of similar size and has a similar wingspan, according to some accounts, although I don't know how you mistake bird feathers for bat wings. (laughs) And sure, a Sandhill Crane has a long beak, I don't know. I don't think it would be easy to think that something that looks like a goat or a horse head versus a, a bird beak. <laughs> I've seen sandhill cranes up close before, so I feel like this is kind of a cop out answer <laughs> to, to to what the Jersey Devil is. Maybe perhaps early colonists who are unfamiliar with the local fauna encountered a creature they had never seen before. Maybe they would think it was some kind of devilish creature. But still, it's just a big bird. I'm not sure how you messed that one up. (laughs) Or, you know, maybe the Jersey Devil 
is actually something supernatural. We'll just never know. And that, my friends, is the story of the Jersey Devil in a nutshell. I hope you enjoyed the show. And thanks again for being patient with me while I've adjusted to being a dad of two on top of everything else going on. But I'm stoked to be back. And a big thank you, as always, to everyone out there listening to the show. Strangeology wouldn't be possible without the support of listeners like you. Despite not putting out anything new in several months, a lot of new people are finding the show. And people out there have been asking when I'm coming back. So thanks for reaching out. Definitely appreciate the support. To any advertisers or companies out there looking to collaborate with the Strangeology podcast, or if you are an author or researcher and would like to be considered for an interview on the show, please send all inquiries to info at strangeology.com. And just to get a head start on this year's event announcements, make sure to mark your calendars for June 3rd in Canton, Ohio for Small Town Monsters very first Monster Fest. I'm going to be vending there along with a lot of other cryptid vendors, podcasters, and the weirdos that you love. (laughs) It's going to be a great time. There's going to be a lot of speakers and it's... It's going to be a big, big event, and I'm really excited to be a part of it. Unfortunately, I won't be attending this year's Cryptid Bash in West Virginia due to some other obligations, but definitely check that out. The Moth Boys put on a good event every year. Hopefully next year I can make it. But I will be attending the Sasquatch Calling Festival again in Whitehall, New York this coming September. So definitely, if you're in the area, stop by, find my tent, (laughs) say hello, and uh, check out all the stuff there. It's a great time. I'll have more details for that as that one draws closer. There may be another event or two in the works, but those are the only ones I have confirmed for the moment. And if you haven't done so yet, definitely make sure to give me a follow over on all my social media accounts. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. I'm most active posting short form content on Instagram and TikTok. So if you're looking for more from me, definitely check that out. (laughs) It's way easier to crank out content for that versus putting out whole podcast episodes. (laughs) So (laughs) we're going to try to, we're going to try to keep to the the two week schedule, maybe two to three week schedule, you know, once, once, once things settle down a little bit more and we can, we can get back into the groove better, but I'm going to try to keep things as, as regular as possible for this season, but don't be too worried if it takes a little, a little longer for me to, to put out an episode. And also don't forget to hit up my YouTube channel this year. I'm going to be trying to push to make more longer form video content over there for people to enjoy as well. And if you're looking for a way to support Strangeology, again, you can check out my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Strangeology. Check out all the benefits. You might find some cool stuff you like. It's a great growing community over there, 30 30 plus people strong, and always looking to have some new people hop on board. You can also head on over to my Etsy shop, strangeology.etsy.com, where I have a whole assortment of cryptid, alien, and Fordian gear available on t-shirts, hoodies, tank tops, stickers, prints, mugs, enamel pins, blankets, tote bags, and more. And for veteran listeners of the show, you know I have my home state cryptids collection with designs for cryptids the most popular cryptids for all 50 states in the United States. And for my Canadian audience out there, you'll be happy to know that I've begun work on a Canadian cryptid collection and map. I've done five designs for five different provinces so far. So definitely check that out on my shop. And I've got some new designs in the works as well for just general cool cryptid wackiness (laughs) wackiness <laughs> and i'm looking to add in some new items this year like patches more enamel pins 
maybe even some other types of merch as well. So definitely stay tuned. All right, I think that's all from me for now. I am going to take a quick break, and when I come back for Strangeology Beyond, the members-only segment of the show, I'm going to be diving into more New Jersey lore, but instead of cryptids, this is going to bend towards the alien persuasion. Patrons, stick with me, and for everyone else, until the next time, take care of yourselves and each other, and keep it strange. Welcome back to this season's first edition of Strangeology Beyond. I hope you enjoyed the main show today. All about my boy, the Jersey.